Hi guys, I hope you're all doing really well. My name is Sarah and welcome back to What the Horror, the channel where we talk about horror movies old and new. It's finally that time. 2022 has come to an end and it's time to rank the newly released horror movies that I personally saw throughout the year. My god, what a year 2022 has been for movies, especially horror movies. This could potentially be the strongest year we've had for horror releases in a long, long time. It's actually been hard work trying to keep up with all of them, especially considering that we now have so many streaming services that you're unlikely to have them all because who has the money to pay for them all? And so you can easily miss some of the films that are released. I'll be honest, if I didn't use Letterboxd religiously, I would have missed a good chunk of the films on this list as there didn't seem to be a lot of people talking about some of them except for in my little horror movie community. If you want to follow me on Letterboxd, the link is in the description box below. I watched a total of 36 new horror movies this year, which is impressive. Not as much as some people, but it's impressive compared to last year's Pitiful 18. There are of course some that I haven't seen yet, either because, well, I just don't want to, or because I haven't got around to it yet. And I haven't actually seen The Menu yet, which is surprising because that was one of three of my most anticipated horror movies of the year. So I am baffled by the fact that I haven't watched it yet. Hopefully I'll see it soon and I imagine it'll be up there high on my list. So when I first started planning this episode, it was originally going to be just one whole episode. But then when I started writing it, I realized that it was going to be a long one. So instead I decided to make it into two episodes, part one and part two. In part one, this episode, I'm going to include my top five favourite non-horror movies at the very end of the video. Yes, I know I'm a horror channel, but this year has been strong for movies in general and I wanted to share my thoughts on a couple of the best. I will timestamp it so you can skip ahead to it or skip it altogether, you do you, but they are worth a watch so maybe stick around and check them out. Other than that, it will be number 36 to number 19 that we're covering in part one. In part two, I will rank the remaining horror movies, 18 to number one. So that will be including my top 10 horror movies of 2022. So I'm going to start at the bottom of the list at number 36 and then work my way up to number one. 36 is a lot of movies to cover, so there'll be some of them that I don't talk about as much as the others. I mean, one reason being that I've actually forgotten what happened in a couple of them. I wonder where they'll end up on my list. Before we get started, just a reminder that this is my list of 2022 horror movies. It's not your list of 2022 horror movies, so don't be surprised if it looks different to yours. This is my list made up of my opinions, and while I do judge movies on their quality and how technically good they are, I also judge them on how much fun I had with them and how likely I am to rewatch them. So no getting angry in the comments, okay? Great. Let's talk movies then. All right then, so coming in at the bottom of the list, for me personally, the worst film of 2022 is Dashcam. Dashcam was produced by Blumhouse and released in theatres. And it might not technically be the worst film released and perhaps there are those out there that really enjoyed it, but I just thought it was so unpleasant. You can't talk about Dashcam without talking about its lead, Annie Hardy. This is a real person playing herself with very extreme views on race, vaxxing and politics. And these views are then given a platform in Dashcam, just full on smashed in your face. But not only that, the film itself is difficult to watch because it's a found footage film and the camera is just shaking all over the place. There are times you can't even see what you're looking at. It's not fun for people with motion sickness, that's for sure. I just couldn't find anything to enjoy. It's a film that is physically difficult to watch and has a lead character who I wanted to be killed off instantly. I couldn't stand following her for the film's runtime and not only was Dashcam bad, but it was so disappointing because I absolutely loved Rob Savage's host that came out in 2020. 
Okay, next we have Firestarter, based on the Stephen King novel of the same name and a remake of the 1984 version. And Firestarter was released in both theatres and on Peacock. Ugh, this film does something worse than being bad. This is a boring and forgettable film. It felt like it had no heart or soul or as if it was just made for making a film sick, if that makes sense. There wasn't even a twisted level of enjoyment in how boring it was. You know, those so bad they're good. This was just bland. But how old do I feel having seen Zac Efron go from playing a teenager to playing a dad? Next we have They Slash Them, produced by Jason Blum and released on Peacock. This had potential, a summer horror, a camp horror, and Kevin Bacon back in horror again. But like Firestarter, this was just boring in a lot of ways. And when it wasn't boring, and some of the scenes that actually had something happening them, or something, you know, a scene that made you feel something, they were so intense that it was unpleasant to watch. Like that god awful dog scene. And for a horror movie, for a slasher movie, there wasn't much scary movie or slashing in it. I mean, the premise of the movie, a conversion camp, is horrifying, but there were no scares past that. Great to have Bacon back though, and the little song and dance scene was quite fun. Then we have The Cellar starring Alicia Cuthbert and released through Shudder, although I saw it on Netflix, so you may be able to watch it through that. So The Cellar is one of those movies I mentioned where I can't remember anything about it. Well, I tell a lie, I can remember a scene where someone is walking down the stairs and counting, but that's it. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I can't remember anything about the film, I assume I didn't like it and it wasn't that good. But I watched the trailer to jog my memory and I do think the setting of the film is a solid one, a huge stately home in the Irish countryside in autumn. I enjoyed that. And it was nice to watch Alicia Cuthbert in horror again, I guess. Next up, it's Grim Cutty, starring Shannon Sosaman? Sosaman and which was released on Hulu or Disney Plus internationally. So in the vein of Slenderman, this is the horror movie that was inspired by the internet meme Momo that was circling a couple of years ago. What's interesting about Grim Cutty is that there's very little horror in it and they actually show the monster in all its glory very early on. And it's an odd looking monster as well. It's like they just slapped a wig on Gru. Another thing that stood out to me about Grim Cutty is how for a huge chunk of the runtime, it's unclear who this film is actually aimed at. I mean, what is the target audience of the film? Part of it seems to be a warning to teens and children about the dangers of online, which, okay, great, yeah, let's educate them, but better than this, surely. And add in the seemingly low age rating, perhaps this is a teen horror, but then there also seems to be a message for adults about how, as parents, we need to be involved in that relationship that our children have with the internet in that we need to extend a level of trust to them and educate ourselves about things like social media memes and challenges instead of just running wild on nothing but hearsay. Both ideas are good, but neither are executed as well as they could be and it just makes the movie muddled. Oh, and I have to say, the dad in this, what a piece of he gives the dad in Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers, a run for his money. Next is the tech horror movie Choose or Die, which stars Asa Butterfield and Robert Englund and was released on Netflix. So I'm a big fan of tech horror. It's one of my favorite subgenres. And I even did an episode on my top 10 tech horror movies earlier this year, which I'll leave a link to either here or in the description box if you're interested. So because of this, I was curious with this one, but I was just disappointed. Don't get me wrong, there were some positives to it. I loved the concept, a killer video game with 80s nostalgia, awesome. Asa Butterfield as a lead, awesome. Robert Englund starring as the terror director of the killer game, awesome. And I really appreciated the relationship between the two leads just being a friendship. Despite it being clear that there was a romantic attraction on his side, we didn't need it to become a romance for us to enjoy the film. We didn't need a will they, won't they dynamic. What was interesting about Choose or Die is that it taps into the current 80s nostalgia we're experiencing, thanks in large part to Stranger Things. But this film does not seem pro 80s. There's no bright neon colors. Everything is really dark and grimy and all of the 80s tech is either broken or damaged. A major negative for me though, is that the film seems to have an odd message. Your reward for surviving pain and suffering is that you can now inflict pain and suffering on others. 
Okay, then we have My Best Friend's Exorcism, which is adapted from the novel of the same name and which was released on Amazon Prime. I haven't read the book myself, so I can't comment on how good it is as an adaptation, but I have heard that the book is better and that the film fails to capture the same magic. This film has some all right scenes, but honestly, a lot of it just had me going, okay then. It doesn't have any horror in it and the comedy side of it felt really forced a lot of the time. The acting wasn't the strongest at times either, but I think the film looked good on the whole. It's yet another production playing on the 80s nostalgia of the moment and I've also seen a lot of people draw comparisons between this and Jennifer's body and how this is clearly treading some similar territory but just in a far inferior way and I can definitely see what they mean by that. Next we have A24's Men. This is the horror movie written by and directed by a man that is telling women about toxic masculinity but with zero subtlety but yet at the same time zero clarity. One of the only female leads in this is solely defined by her trauma caused at the hands of a man and so she now hates all men but all men are toxic anyway so she's got every right to do so. Jesus movie, chill out. This has been a year of movies dealing with the different ways men and women experience the world and this film just failed to deliver that in a good way. And for me, the film is nothing other than that message with some elevated horror style shots thrown in. I mean, the movie is saying, look how awful and toxic men are. Well, first of all, not all men are toxic and I think that the movie can be insulting in that way, but also, yeah, I know. I've experienced it firsthand. I don't need you movie telling me. But I will end on saying kudos to filming it in Bluebell season in England. Just stunning. Okay, next we have a film that I've not really heard anyone else talk about and that is the sequel to The Reef, The Reef Stalked. Well, I say it's a sequel. It doesn't actually have anything to do with the first film. It's more of a sequel in spirit. Look, if you've followed me for a while, then you know I'm a sucker for an aquatic horror especially a shark movie. They don't even have to be a good shark movie, which works well because this is not a good shark movie. I think it's one of three shark movies to be released this year, but this is the only one of them that I've actually watched. It's not the worst shark movie I've ever seen, but it also wasn't anything special. Although there was one really good scene involving two of the female leads, two kayaks and so much tension. Other than that, the dialogue is iffy. They use loads of stock shark footage and because it's what we're doing now, they crowbar some trauma and metaphors for trauma in there too. But honestly, I still had fun. There was enjoyment in how bad it was. Okay, this next one might annoy some people. In fact, it's one of two films that might annoy people. And that is the new installment of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which was released on Netflix. I love the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre and I was legit excited for this one, but... It was yet another disappointment. Not that it's ever been the strongest franchise. I mean, some of those sequels are questionable. I'm looking at you, the next generation. Without a doubt, this movie had some stunning shots and used light in such a wonderful way, especially in the scene where Sally is in the sunflower field. Gorgeous. But the dialogue was really weak and there were some major plot issues. But not only that, but it attempts to deal with some pretty heavy subject matter that is actually worth tackling. But then it's just oddly thrown out of the window when all of the action gets going. And what they do to Sally is unforgivable. They try to go down the same route as Laurie 2018 with Sally becoming a weapon toting badass, but is apparently also now really stupid, using people as bait, making terrible choices, and is then killed and literally thrown out like she's trash. The end scene was granted quite shocking, but I find it hard to believe that a 70 something old leather face is capable of lifting people up, throwing them across rooms, snapping arms with his bare hands and withstanding attack after attack. I mean, he has never been portrayed as being supernatural like Jason or Michael. So it's just unbelievable that after all of that, he gets up and drags Mel out of the moving car. 
Then we have She Will, a British film that has Dario Argento among its executive producers. It stars Alice Krieg, Andy McDowell and Rupert Everett and available to rent and buy from multiple streaming platforms. This is another of those films that I couldn't remember that much about, which is why again it's at the lower end of the list. It's a film that is trying to tackle a lot of modern relevant topics, especially the relationship between the actress and the director, but everything here is done in a very subtle way. So subtle that some things are never really cleared up or explained that fully. It was filmed in and is set in Scotland and has some of the most jaw-dropping imagery in all of the movies I've seen this year. The scenery is just stunning. It has lots of witchy tones to it, delving into the history of women that were burned as witches on the land hundreds of years ago, and there is a hint at the lead character dabbling in the witchy world. The reason why it's not higher for me is that it just hit a little too hard and felt a little too raw, plus I completely forgot about it after watching it, so... Next we have Rob Zombie's The Munsters, which was released on Netflix and stars Sherry Moon Zombie, of course, and Jeff Daniel Phillips as Lily and Herman Munster. I love the original Munsters TV series, I used to watch it growing up and I was intrigued to watch this. Not excited, but intrigued. What was really intriguing about this film though is the age rating. Gone are the usual zombie staples of profanities and violence. The film itself was alright in the end, I loved the costume design, the gothic outfits were so fun and I liked the Transylvania setting and it was brilliant to see the Munster's house on Mot um, Mottingbird? Mockingbird Lane. I thought the casting of the Count or Grandpa was spot on, he did a perfect job with his line delivery and mannerisms and I have to say I don't think Sherry Moon was that bad either. But I think Jeff Daniel Phillips was the wrong casting for Herman. I know some people think he did a great job, but it was a miss for me, and not only the casting, but the actual portrayal of the character as well. This was not the Herman of the TV series. Then we have the film I've watched the most recently on this list, and that is Pray for the Devil, which was released in theatres, but is now streaming on Prime. This was the release for Halloween Horror Movie, and did not do very well. A lot of the complaints are it's yet another possession movie, yet another contorting girl, and yet another mediocre horror movie. And they're all valid complaints to be honest, but I still had fun with the film. I think I'd be more annoyed if I'd paid for the movie, well I still paid for the movie as I pay for Prime, but I didn't pay for an expensive theatre ticket to then be met with Pray for the Devil. I just watched it on streaming one cold winter's morning and it was fine. It was a good enough time. Maybe it helped that I wasn't expecting much, as it was impossible to avoid the reaction to it on Letterboxd, but while I did find some enjoyment in it, I do still have some issues with it. The first being that the entire plot was predictable. I'd figured out who the little girl was very early on, so there was no level of surprise or suspense, and I guess we've girl bossed everything else, so now we have to girl boss the Catholic faith and exorcisms. And <laughs> that final scene where she grabs her cross and shoves it at the camera, I mean, yeah, sure, worth a laugh, but <laughs> it was like a cheesy early 2000s superhero movie. The next one is Christmas Bloody Christmas, which was released on Shudder. This is the only one of the new Christmas movies that I've managed to get around to watching. The one I really wanted to see was Violent Night, as we are fans of David Harbour in this household. I actually met him back in 2020, before the world went to hell, and he's a really sweet guy. Very tall. My thoughts on Christmas Bloody Christmas were... meh. I'm sorry, it's a middling movie for me personally, and I'm disappointed I didn't love it more, because I've seen some people absolutely loving this, and I'm really happy for them that they now have a new horror Christmas movie to watch every year. It just didn't hit me in that way. I loved the soundtrack, and I thought it was a great choice to film in 16mm. The whole film has this grainy look to it, and it makes all of the bright Christmas lights just bleed into each other, which looks fab, but... The lead female character was so irritating for so much of the runtime that I simply did not root for her to survive. <laughs> and the biggest issue for me, the main offender, was the constant stream of what felt like endless false endings. It was, she kills the robot Santa, she sits for a moment, the robot Santa gets back up and she says, you've got to be kidding me, and lather, rinse, repeat until you lose the will to live. 
Then we have Monstrous starring the Queen, Christina Ricci, and which you can watch on Paramount Plus, Prime and Apple TV. Monstrous is one that I've not really heard anyone talk about, and to be honest, I only watched it because it has Christina Ricci in it. It follows her character as she and her seven-year-old son flee her abusive husband, and they set up home in a gorgeous big farmhouse in the 1950s. Ricci, as always, gives a good performance and is utterly compelling as a mum trying to protect her son. And when the film has some tragic twists, she damn near breaks your heart. I loved the 50s setting because I'm a sucker for those eras. And while it was not only set in the 50s, it also had a real feeling of a 50s B movie to it. The film has a few twists and turns, but for the most part, it is a very simple story that delves into some pretty dark topics. I will say though that the monster special effects aren't the best. Then we have The Invitation, which stars Natalie Emmanuel from Game of Thrones and was released in theatres. Aside from men and dashcam, this is one of the films on the list that annoyed me the most. Not in the same way or to the same level as men and dashcam, but oh boy. Look, I was excited like every other fan of vampire films. Yay, we're getting a new vampire film, finally. But the trailer gave away that little fact and the movie itself just isn't a very good vampire film. We know from the trailer that we're expecting vampires, but then we wait for most of the film and don't get very much vampire action in the end. This was another good looking movie though. It was well lit and the house and the grounds were well dressed. The lead was well acted for the most part, but the rest not so much. And the scares were pretty lacking. My two major issues with the film, though, are first how lazy the writing is. Like for some reason, Blair Butler just invented an airport in Whitby. I know it's not a major point, but it's irritating. A simple Google will tell you that there's no airport in Whitby. Evie had never seen or heard of nesting dolls before, and even though Evie and her friend are supposed to be smart, cautious women when it comes to men and safety, they go all gooey over some guy just because he's rich and has a British accent and a nice smile. And secondly, I take issue with the movie accusing an entire country of racism based off of the actions of its ancestors hundreds of years ago. I'd like to know which country on this planet can honestly say their ancestors never messed up on a monumental scale. Then we have Mr. Harrigan's Phone, which stars Jaden Martell and Donald Sutherland and was released on Netflix. The film is an adaptation of the novella of the same name written by Stephen King. It's a teen horror drama which explores the potential horrors and dangers of modern technology. When I watched Mr. Harrigan's Phone, I thought it was okay. I enjoyed it, but probably wouldn't watch it again. And when I went to review it, I saw so many people ripping it to shreds. And it was then that I asked myself, when did we lose the ability to just find a film okay, adequate, just all right? Why does every film have to be the best film we've ever seen or the worst film we've ever seen? To me, Mr. Harrigan's phone was okay, and that was enough. There were some good scenes and some good acting. People will have worked hard on this, and while I didn't love it, I appreciate the work that went into it. Next, we have Werewolf by Night, which was released on Disney Plus and produced by Marvel. I'm adding this to the list because even though it's technically a TV special and not very scary, it does deal with monsters that you would find in the Universal Monster Universe. This was a much needed, new and refreshing, innovative entry for Marvel after a few hit and miss entries lately. The majority of the movie is pretty by the books and slow, but it more than makes up for it by the last third of the film. What also helps this film stand out is that it's all in black and white, which just adds to the whole classic monster atmosphere. All right then, to wrap up this episode, let's talk about my top five non-horror movies, because believe it or not, I do actually watch the odd movie that isn't horror. But before we get into those, just in case you don't want to stick around for them, don't forget this is only part one of my ranking of the 2022 horror movies. So if you haven't already, don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss out on part two or on my most anticipated horror movies of 2023, which will be dropping soon. Okay, before the top five, I do have two honourable mentions. The first one is the Bob's Burgers movie because I adore Bob's Burgers. I'm always working my way through another rewatch and the movie was just so fun and sweet. And the second honourable mention is the unbearable weight of massive talent. Honestly, watching Nick Cage and Pedro Pascal talk about movies was just like finding my people. It's a bit hammy in places, but heartwarming and funny in others. Okay, so my number five is a film that probably won't be high on many other people's lists, but for me it's up here purely for nostalgia and a pre-existing love, and that is Uncharted. Yes, I am well aware it's not technically a great movie. However, 
Uncharted is my favourite game series of all time and I will love it with my dying breath, so I'm a little biased. Movies based on video games don't have the best track record, but this was a pretty good adaption of the games. You had the adventure, the snappy dialogue, the puzzles and a big boss ending. And the cast of Nate and Sully wasn't perfect, but again, pretty good. I had been excited for this since I'd first heard of it and while I went in with mid to low expectations I ended up having a really fun time and loved all of the little nods to the game and I nearly cried when Nolan North, who voices Nate in the games, popped up in a cameo. My number four is Jackass Forever. I've been a fan of Jackass ever since it was just a TV series and this was another one I was excited for. It's been over 10 years since the last one and I think all Jackass fans were curious to see how the original cast would do now that they're, well, older. And while it provided the usual stunts and humour, I didn't expect to feel as moved by it as I was. I honestly think that Jackass Forever and Jackass 4.5 was exactly what 2022 needed. Middle-aged men doing stupid stunts, Johnny Knoxville as a silver fox and Ryan Dunn forever. Number three is The Batman starring Robert Pattinson and Zoe Kravitz. I think this was my favourite Batman movie since Christopher Nolan's trilogy. The whole film noir private detective of the 40s vibe is very me and who doesn't love an emo Batman? And for all those people who got so angry about the announcement that Pattinson was cast as Batman, I hope that you actually watched the movie and saw how good a job he ended up doing. The guy has done plenty of good movies after Twilight, give him a break. What I loved about it is it felt really fresh after some recent Batman incarnations where they've lent a lot more to the action side and they've drifted away from the gothic side of it. This Batman is really dark and moody and goes so far into the gothic side of it that even when Bruce Wayne is just him, he's still really dark and broody. The supporting cast is excellent, especially Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman and Jeffrey Wright as Commissioner Gordon. And it is a beautifully shot movie, which more than makes up for a few weak plot points. My number two is the movie I've seen the most recently out of these non-horror movies, but holy hell is it a f masterpiece. And that is Top Gun Maverick. All right, I'm going to have to try to contain myself from spending another half hour gushing about number two and number one on this list. And my voice has gone really high. <laughs> I have been a big fan of Top Gun since I was little. I used to watch it with my mum because it was one of her favourites for many reasons, but one of them being Tom Cruise. But the film was a big part of my childhood and the soundtrack a big part of my day-to-day -day life, still. So it was with the utmost excitement that I waited for its release, especially as it didn't drop until about two years after the trailer came out. What they did and achieved with Maverick is simply phenomenal. It's well known, the work ethic that Tom Cruise has, and he made it clear he wouldn't do a sequel until they had the right story and the right tech to put the audience in the cockpit of the planes. And the story they delivered is perfect. It's exciting, it's heartwarming, it's heartbreaking. And there's something about watching it, having grown up with the first one, seeing them young, now watching this as an adult, seeing them older, it has this gorgeous look at reminiscing, reflecting on the past while also embracing the future but finding your place in it. And if you have the physical copy of it, I would highly recommend watching the special features because it's so interesting to find out how they filmed it and how the actors are genuinely flying the F-18s and genuinely flying at 8Gs trying not to pass out. The level of work that went into this pays off big time. It has immediately gone into my top 10 films of all time. And my number one horror movie, and I'll be honest, my favourite film overall of 2022, is Baz Luhrmann's Elvis. Oh man, this movie, this friggin' movie. So, like with Maverick, I have been an Elvis fan since I was little. A lot of my music taste comes from my parents, we were a very music-centric house, but Elvis was mine. I discovered him on my own and have listened to him ever since. I'm also a huge Baz Luhrmann fan, and so, I cannot put into words how excited I was when this film was announced. Baz is one of those directors who understands the importance and power of music in a movie, and he creates these sensually delicious films in both the visuals and the sound design. And Elvis is his absolute crescendo. This movie made me feel a whole range of things, and I didn't fully process my thoughts on it until days later. Even now, months later, I'm still processing it and thinking new things. Like for example, 
I realised the other day that what Baz did with this movie, which is an assault on the senses, is he bottled up and delivered the closest thing I think I will ever have to seeing Elvis perform live. This mixture of intense, overwhelming, fizzing excitement and pure joyous enjoyment of the music. I could talk about this movie until the cows come home, but I have to keep it short. So let me just add that what Baz Luhrmann found in Austin Butler is nothing short of perfection. This is a guy who took this project on and dedicated himself to it for years, perfecting the voice, the movements, and most importantly, the soul of Elvis. Between Baz's genius, Austin's performance, and everyone else from the costume design to the camera work, and most importantly, the music, which is no lie, playing in my house every single day, they created a wonderful experience and my second favourite movie of all time. All right, guys, so that's it for part one of 2022 Horror Movies Ranked. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know some of your favourites in the comments below. Let's talk about and celebrate this incredible year for cinema. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on part two, which is coming very soon. Keep an eye out for it because it will also include my top 10 horror movies of 2022. In the meantime, thank you as always for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves and I will talk to you in the next episode. Bye guys.